Buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Arriba, todos, perfecto. Pues vamos a iniciar con nuestra ponencia magistral, la primera del coloquio, y estamos muy complacidos de tener entre nosotros a Anne Maeu. I hope it's a good way to say. <laughs> eh, y nos va a um, platicar acerca de uh, preservation and conservation in the age of Google, its library and archives Canada. Pero primero déjenme presentar un poco a Anne. Uh, completó sus estudios en conservación de arte en el Strauss Center of Conservation de la Universidad de Harvard y, uh, en Estados Unidos y la maestría en conservación de arte en el Queen University, ese es en Canadá. Uh, asistió al primer curso de conservación de papel del CROM en Roma en 1985 y al curso de conservación de papel japonés, también de Nikron, en Japón, en 2011. Obtuvo el premio Rome Prize en la Academia Americana en Roma en 1996. Trabajó en la National Gallery de Canadá como conservadora de impresos y dibujos por 26 años, y de 2009 a 2017 en el Archivo y Biblioteca Nacionales de Canadá como jefa de conservación de mapas, manuscritos y obra gráfica sobre papel. Actualmente se dedica a la práctica privada en Ottawa. Cuenta con una amplia trayectoria en la conservación y restauración de soportes de papel, reflejado también en su investigación y publicaciones en materia de conservación de acervos documentales, especialmente sobre el uso de pasteles de Degas y sus contemporáneos italianos así como tratamiento específico como el uso de geles rígidos en la restauración de papel y uh, es parte del curso que va a impartir el jueves y el viernes Ann. Bienvenida Ann, este, le damos la palabra. Gracias. Thank you. And thank you to Dr. Salgado Vireles for this invitation to speak to you today at this international colloquium on conservation and restoration in libraries and archives. It is my pleasure to be able to share with you some of my thoughts on the impact of digital technology and the ensuing 21st century preservation challenges that face institutions like libraries, Library and Archives Canada. How do we meet the unprecedented demand for access to our rich collections in the age of Google? The idea for this talk actually took root during a trip to Washington a few years ago. I had never been to the National Archives and Records Administration, which is also known as NARA. And I was curious to see the Declaration of Independence and the other important documents that are displayed there. In Canada, we were in the process of preparing one of our most significant founding documents, the Proclamation of the Constitution, for exhibition at the New Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, which is in the center of our country. It was leaving LAC for the very first time in over 25 years. So I wondered, how would we measure up to the American experience? What I witnessed on that day that I visited the archives surprised me. Even before I entered the building, First thing in the morning, there was a long line of people waiting outside as if for a blockbuster exhibition. I have to say I wondered why, and here may be a possible answer. Okay. It is surrounded by guards and video monitors and little families from Iowa and little kids under eighth grade field trips. And beneath an inch of bulletproof glass is an army of sensors and heat monitors that will go off if someone gets too close with a high fever. Now, when it's not on display, it is lowered into a four-foot-thick concrete 
steel plate vault that happens to be equipped with a electronic combination lock and biometric access denial system. The preservation. Enjoy. Go ahead. Do you know what the preservation room is for? Delicious jams and jellies? No, that's where they clean, repair, and maintain all the documents and the storage housings when they're not on display or in the vault. Now, when the case needs work, they take it out of the vault, directly across the hall, and into the preservation room. The best time for us or Ian to steal it would be during the gala this weekend, and the guards are distracted by the VIPs upstairs. But we'll make our way to the preservation room, where there's much less security. Huh. Well... If Ian, uh, preservation, hmm. the gala, this might be possible. It might. So perhaps some of you have seen this movie. Well, here is a fun fact. The movie actually boosted attendance at the National Archives. And this was perhaps the reason for the large crowd at the National Archives the morning that I was there. Trouble with my mouse. Okay. Popular films have often have the have of, often have the residual effect of drawing interest to real life locations or subject matter incorporated into their plots. And this is what actually happened with the National Treasure movies. And there are statistics to say that there was an uptake in attendance at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. after these movies were released. Now here's another local fun fact and something that I just learned yesterday. You probably have, I hope you all have seen this because it's very local and dear to your hearts, the opening scene of Spectre, a James Bond film, when there is a Day of the Dead parade here in Mexico City. But that parade was entirely fictional. But I understand that the scene inspired officials to host a similar parade here in Mexico City. I think that's pretty cool. So if links to popular culture can get officials to plan parades or persuade more people to visit institutions like libraries and archives, we need to explore how else the digital age can make us relevant. There is no doubt that the digital age poses challenges for memory institutions to remain relevant by making their collections easily accessible. Library and Archives Canada is no exception. It seeks to be an institution at the leading edge of new technologies in archival and library science. Technology offers the chance to digitize, thus improving access, description, and discoverability of our collections. So in this talk, I will explore some of the ways that LAC has responded to demands for greater access to and discoverability of collection material. But where does mass digitization of collection material leave the so-called bricks and mortar experience of exhibiting or consulting the original object. Will access to our collections via a digital platform ever take the place to bring to being in the presence of the real thing? What other ways can we explore to increase exposure to our collections? How has LAC's ambitious program impacted preservation and conservation activities? How has the digital age impacted the conservation profession? And how can we deal with this new reality in the age of Google? In a recent lecture, Dr. Guy Bertillon, who has just retired as our librarian and archivist of Canada, posited that there is a power to exhibiting authentic objects that exceeds the digital world. Visits to museums and libraries are in fact on the rise. As he said, in a digital age, memory itself may seem obsolete. With the mind-blowing speed of their algorithm, algorithms, aren't Google, Amazon, Wikipedia, Facebook, and Twitter good enough for remembering? 
in spite of information and images being a click away, data shows that more people are using memory institutions than ever. This counterintuitive fact has led the British Library to conclude this in a maybe not so recent document, but recent enough. The more screen-based our lives, it seems, the greater the perceived value of human encounters and physical artifacts. Activity in each realm feeds interest in the other. So first of all, I'd like to start with an introduction to Library and Archives Canada. Located in Ottawa, Ontario, our nation's capital, it was first established in 1872 as the Dominion Archives of Canada, and strangely as a division within the Department of Agriculture. In 1912, it was granted autonomy as the Public Archives of Canada. The National Library of Canada was founded 42 years later, in 1952. Canada became one of the first countries in the world to combine its nat national library and its national archives in 2004 through an act of parliament that united the functions of the two institutions. This arose from the vision of a new kind of knowledge institution, fully integrated between two disciplines and equipped to respond to the information demands of the 21st century. We are the only G20 country with this kind of combined national institution. Belgium, the Netherlands, and New Zealand have all tried to merge their national library and archives, and they've all failed. Singapore, however, did it in 2012, and so far they have been successful. So you can imagine it's not an easy challenge. LAC's mandate is broad and comprehensive. It must protect, protect, preserve the documentary heritage of Canada and make it accessible. It facilitates cooperation among Canadian communities in ensuring the acquisition, preservation, and dissemination of knowledge. And it operates as the continuing memory of the Canadian government and its institutions. We achieve this through a variety of programs and services that meet the needs of our clients, such as maintaining legal deposit of all published heritage from and about Canada, determining which government records are of archival and historic value, maintaining the National Union Catalog, developing national and international standards in the area of archival and library science, running the documentation, documentary heritage communities program, which funds projects that increase access to and awareness of Canada's local heritage. Our services include access to information so that Canadians can get the information they want from the government, reference services for those who consult our collections, including journalists, researchers, students, professors, and the public in general, and services for publishers, such as international standard book number and cataloging in, in publication. We are also the stewards of a vast collection of digital and analog records. And I think, if, as you can see from this list, we do have a pretty good idea of what we have in our holdings. 22 million books, periodicals, government publications, 250 kilogram, or kilometers of government and private textual records, 3 million architectural drawings, maps, and plans, 30 million photographs, 550,000 hours of audio and video recordings. Apparently, that's enough to keep you occupied for the next 63 years. 425,000 works of art, 547,000 musical items, and last but not least, we have the largest collection of documentary art in the world from Canada. LAC presently consists of several buildings within a 30-kilometer radius of Ottawa. Regional preservation and storage facilities for federal government records are also found in locations across Canada. Within the National Capital Region, there are three state-of-the-art LAC buildings, 
in addition to the original National Library building. A nitrate film preservation facility was officially opened in 2011, and it houses Canada's cellulose nitrate film collection, which contains almost 6,000 film reels dating back to 1912, including some of the first Canadian motion pictures and photographic negatives. The film material is highly sensitive and requires precise temperatures for its preservation. 21 storage vaults are set at 2 degrees Celsius and 25% relative humidity. And three acclimatization vaults are set to 10 degrees to provide an interim holding space for material being transferred to ambient conditions. It is an eco-design building featuring an environmentally friendly green roof that provides better insulation in our extreme climate and minimizes energy expenditures. This is a high-density storage facility where the national newspaper collection and records of Second World War veterans are stored. This facility features a high bay metal shelving system with an environment of 20 degrees Celsius and 40% relative humidity. And finally, the conservation facilities of Library and Archives Canada are situated in a state-of-the-art preservation center in Gatineau, Quebec, just across the river from Ottawa. It was designed and purpose-built to also provide a safe environment for the long-term storage and preservation of LAC's diverse holdings. It was officially opened in 1997 after four years of construction. While most buildings try to achieve only 50 or 100 years of service, the building was purposely designed to last for at least 500 years of service with minimal material replacement. The GPC consists of a three-story concrete vault core at the center of a glass-enveloped structure. Staff offices and individual laboratories for conservation treatment, preservation copying of records, and digitization are constructed in a village-like setting on the top floor of the building, directly over the three-story concrete vault structure. This enables all preservation and conservation staff, which is approximately 100 in total, to work together under the same roof. Here's a detail, or it's an aerial view of one of the conservation labs. This is the um, book conservation lab. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems are located in a mechanical plant designed to be separate from but connected to the building. There are 48 vaults that house different collections that make up the LAC holdings. Environmental set points for each vault are adjusted to accommodate the specific collection material. And here you can see the various environmental set points and the types of vault material that are, are um, housed in those particular uh, vaults. So here, for an example, is the, the antechamber to the cold storage vault, which is set at minus 18 degrees Celsius and 25% relative humidity. And on the right, you see the black and white motion picture vault, which is plus 18 degrees and 35% RH. The fine art vault is 18 degrees and 50% RH, while the document and paper vaults are at 18 degrees and 40% relative humidity. Conservation services fall under two groups that are broadly defined as digital and analog. Specialty labs provide preservation facilities for archival film, photography, imaging, <clears throat> excuse me, and video and audio recordings. <clears throat> Conservation of the analog collection is divided into five specialties. Books, maps and manuscripts, works of art on paper, photographs, and oil paintings all of which occupy separate, spacious, and well-equipped laboratories. 
In addition to working on the LAC holdings, conservators also have a range of duties that range from conducting research into conservation materials and techniques, developing treatment protocols to work for specific materials within the holdings, conducting technical evaluations of storage materials, and participating in national outreach activities to highlight our work, to name a few. Treatments performed on documents at LAC vary from minimal interventions intended to make as many items available for consultation and digitization as possible, to more extensive treatments when an item will be used for loan, exhibition, publication, or other special use. Activities range from the physical examination of new acquisitions to detailed treatments on single items. About a month ago, ground was broken for a new preservation facility for textual records, which is known as GPC2. It will be located behind and physically connected to LAC's, LAC's existing preservation center. The new facility is a specialized, flexible, and sustainable building with objectives aligned to meet the Government of Canada's priorities to invest in sustainable federal infrastructure and Canadian culture. The new preservation centre will be the first net zero carbon facility dedicated to archival preservation in the Americas and the first federal building constructed to the requirements of Canada's greening government strategy. The main features of a net zero carbon building are minimal carbon emissions from energy consumption achieved through building design and efficiency measures, energy needs met through carbon-free fuel sources, and minimal embodied carbon in building materials. At the leading edge of technology, this new state-of-the-art facility will be the world's largest that is equipped with an automated storage and retrieval system for archival collections. And I'm guessing this means we'll have robots. The center will provide 21,500 cubic meters, or the equivalent of about 8.5 Olympic swimming pools of collection storage capacity in two highly controlled environments across six vaults. Digitization is a big part of our business. As with many other cultural institutions, LAC has focused on excelling in digital access and digital preservation, as well as maintaining the acquisition and preservation of analog or non-digital materials. There is an increased emphasis on ensuring that LAC collection material is accessible through a digital platform, including its website, blogs, and podcasts, and also through social networking services like Twitter and Facebook. In addition, the collection is made known through an active exhibitions and loans program. As part of the workflow process, in the digitization labs, any material requested for digitization by internal or external clients is first triaged to assess condition prior to scanning. A continuous stream of various objects are brought to the conservation labs for fastener removal, flattening, cleaning, there's an example of cleaning, cleaning and minor tear repair to ensure that the objects can be safely handled and passed through the scanners without causing further damage. The largest and most ambitious digitization project to date involved the scanning of over 640,000 Canadian Expeditionary Forces soldiers' files from the First World War. 30 million pages of the most heavily requested material on deposit at LAC are now accessible on our site. Over half a, mil, half a petabyte of high resolution still image data was generated, ensuring the long term preservation of these unique and fragile documents for future generations. Clients can easily and quickly download high quality digital copies of these service files 
free of charge. To deal with large-scale projects, like the CEF digitization project, a competition is held periodically in order to form a pool of qualified conservators and conservation technicians. The work is simply too much for the permanent employees at LAC to deal with. Once accepted into the pool, individuals are contacted when preservation and conservation services are needed. Depending on the size of the project, contract conservators can be accommodated in our spacious labs or can work in satellite labs set up in other parts of the building. A senior LAC conservator is tasked with supervising the contract team, providing quality control and ensuring that the work is carried out efficiently. Before the Canadian Expeditionary Force document scanning could begin, millions of fasteners, paper clips, brass pins and staples had to be carefully removed from the files. A conservation team was assembled, and at its peak, a team of 30 contract conservators was set up in a satellite lab to prepare the files for scanning. Another team sorted the documents for scanning based on size and condition, and this was followed by the actual digital imaging using various types of scanners. An interesting anecdote related to this project is the work of local artist and LAC employee Sarah Hatton, who had permission to use over 260 kilograms of those removed brass fasteners for a commemorative series of artworks that show how the stars, marked by the century-old brass fasteners, would have appeared on the final day of several major battles of the First World War in which Canadian sol soldiers fought. So this is based upon their respective dates and geographic locations. And I show you here a detail of one of these works showing the constellations at Vimy. There are currently no permanent exhibition spaces at LAC, but collection materials have been temporarily exhibited in the past for special events or lent to other institutions. The incentive to provide secure and environmentally stable display conditions has a long and patchy history. While there is a gallery in that original National Archives building in downtown Ottawa, the environmental controls are problematic, and objects that are proposed for exhibition and display must be carefully assessed and fitted with microclimate enclosures or with humidity controlled or in humidity controlled vitrines. Over the last 20 years, traditional preservation measures such as filtering ultraviolet light, reducing exposure time, and limiting the cumulative light dose have been applied. But in the past, gradual and irreversible light fading of media on some collection materials has nevertheless occurred. Thanks, however, to Monsieur Bertillon, a number of partnerships with other institutions, both regional and national, has ensured that our collection material is accessible. We have expanded the reach of our services to both ends of the country and have relocated our regional offices to the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax on the East Coast and to the Vancouver Library, which is on the West Coast. Dedicated gallery spaces now exist at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa and at the Glenbow Museum in Calgary. Plans are in the works for our public service point in Winnipeg, too, and these plans will bring our services closer to the public. We've also worked extensively with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba and at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg to ensure that as many Canadians as possible have access to their heritage. 
Recently, ground has also been broken for a combined Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada building that will offer a modern, dynamic, and multi-purpose space that will improve access, make our documenta documentary heritage more accessible, and provide ample room for exhibitions and public events. In 2017, Canada marked 150 years of nationhood. And I know that may not seem old to, compared to other countries like yours, but our country planned for a year-long celebration of special events that stretched literally from coast to coast. This had an impact in the form of increased loan and display requests for documents at LAC, which is the major repository for Canada's foundational documents that are integral to our identity, governments, rights, and freedoms. And I, I, I think it was Fernando that made a comment about how conservators have a reputation of saying no, no, no. Well, we certainly learned to compromise during 2017. One of our early local partnerships with the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau was inaugurated during the sesquicentennial celebrations with a permanent gallery space dedicated to Library and Archives Canada artifacts within the museum. It was, however, the lone request for the proclamation of the Constitution that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that gave rise to serious discussions about exposure protocols and display parameters for founding documents and other important objects in our collection. This led to a productive collaboration between scientist, collection manager, and conservator in designing a suitable state-of-the-art case for its display. I'd like to provide a bit of the background history of this particular document, as it has informed many of our decisions as we moved forward with design and construction of the display case. The Proclamation of the Constitution Act gives Canada the power to amend its own constitution without seeking prior approval from the British government. And it epitomizes Canada's journey from colony to independent nation. There are actually two copies of the proclamation. In April 1982, the first copy was signed on Parliament Hill by, the, by Queen Elizabeth II and then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in an open air ceremony under light rain. This copy of the proclamation is unofficially referred to as the raindrop version because of the solubilized smudges of ink that are now considered to be part of its history. The second copy was later signed in a private ceremony indoors. A year later, it was intentionally vandalized when a visitor posing as an art student poured red paint on the document to protest Canada's decision to permit US cruise missile testing in Canadian airspace, which he considered to be a flagrant violation of his rights under the new Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Conservators were able to remove much of the thick red paint seen here in a detail but it left, as you can see, a permanent stain in the handmade Manitoba flax paper. After great debate on whether or not to replace the document and numerous attempts on test samples to reduce the stain, the decision was made to leave the stain as evidence as part of its history. And not surprisingly, this copy is referred to as the red stain version. The design of the case for the loan of the proclamation, and it was the raindrop version that was going to be, go, be going on the loan, had to satisfy three criteria, preservation, security, and access. Balancing such issues requires a collaborative approach with input from security personnel, archivists, collection managers, conservation scientists, and conservators. Moving forward with planning within a tight deadline by the time they decided to approve the loan, the collections manager reviewed a decade's worth of previous research performed at CCI 
the Canadian Conservation Institute on case specifications. Using the rationale that a storage case would live the majority of its life in a vault and would not need the added protection and expense of bulletproof glass, a two-part case system was designed, an inner preservation storage case that can be installed in a larger display case. The preservation or storage case is, a, is intended to be the permanent home for the document, addressing mainly issues related to environment. And his, it, the permanent home at this point is in a secure vault at LAC. When the document is required for display, the storage case fits perfectly into the display case, which focuses on delivering the bulk of security requirements. Scientists at CCI were integral to the case design process. That cumulative light exposure of the two copies of the proclamation had resulted in perceived fading of the signature inks, oops, I skipped ahead, was confirmed by microfade testing of the inks conducted in 2012 by CCI scientist Season Say. Testing showed that all the signature inks on both copies have high light sensitivities of British Wool Standard 3 or lower. Microwave testing, microwave, microfade testing is a relatively new technique of determining the potential fade rate of inks, dyes, and pigments. By performing an accelerated light aging test, the time required to fade a pinpoint of ink or color is measured. A minute but powerful beam of light shines directly on its target until the, un the unit detects fading. The light is 40 to 60 lux and is more powerful than the noonday sun. However, the temperature is less than 28 degrees Celsius. It's got to be stronger than, it's 40 to 60 times stronger than the noonday sun, not lux, excuse me. The average test runs for about 10 minutes. The result is not visible to the naked eye, and the process uses a standard scale of the, of the blue wool rating. And on a scale of one to eight, one to three is the most sensitive and indicates a high risk of fading. LAC also collaborated with CCI to determine if a low oxygen environment would significantly improve the light fastness of the signature inks. Scientists Eric Hagen and Season did some tests, and the results suggested that the benefits of an anoxic environment could be minimal, and the amount difficult to determine, since their findings were obtained using an ink with a different composition than the signature inks. Anoxic refers to low oxygen and typically involves using valves to flush the oxygen out of a sealed case, replacing it with an inert gas, usually nitrogen. Because oxygen speeds up the deterioration of organic materials, like paper, anoxic environments provide a good option for slowing deterioration and adding to the long-term preservation of materials. A cautious approximation based on CCI's tests and those at the Getty Institute consider a worst case scenario of zero benefit or no effect and a best case scenario of two to four times slower fading in a low oxygen environment. So according to CCI microfade tests, noticeable fading of the inks used in the proclamation occur at approximately 300 kilolux hours. This amount of exposure must be divided over a set time frame in order to develop an exposure policy. Collections management in consultation with conservation proposed 50 years of cumulative exposure as an, as an allowable time frame before just noticeable fading occurs. So this breaks down to 150 lux hours exposure time per year, which is the equivalent to about 15 days at 10 hours a day at a maximum light level of 40 lux. Of course, the exposure time can be increased if we have a light to view or automatically tinting laminate smart glass, 
and I'll talk more about that in a moment. The variables can be manipulated to calculate exposure in terms of lux hours, days of exposure per year, etc. The fading of the signature inks on the raindrop version was no doubt in great part due to this segment of its display history. Every July between 1987 and 1998, a round-the-clock guard of RCMP officers provided security during an annual monthly display of the proclamation at that National Archives building downtown, while the document racked up hours of light exposure, often under fluorescent elements. An anonymous member of the public commented at the time, could you bring it to the attention of the National Archivist how pathetic the installation for this document is? When people come, all they will see is the reflection of the lighted ceiling because of the poor design of the exhibit. The glass becomes a mirror. It is putting us up as ridiculous and reflects a total lack of respect for the most important document of the nation. Existing storage case designs developed at the Library of Congress provided a starting point for us. Colleagues there and at NARA, which began our talk, were most generous with information based on their own experiences. Here are some images of the Waltzemuller 1507 world map, the largest anoxic case built thus far at the Library of Congress. There are currently five anoxic cases for five of its library treasures and two rare maps. And in fact, anoxic storage is now a requirement for all Library of Congress collection items of significant cultural heritage. Not cheap. So we collaborated with CCI. Their contribution included conducting research, contributing advice, and helping to develop designs and shop drawings for the contractors, which was a substantial savings for us. So here is conservation scientist Eric Hagen, who developed the design working on the interior fittings. The requirements for the, the storage case design had to address major preservation, logistical, and fiscal, fiscal concerns. It had to be airtight, include UV anti-reflective glass, to be machined from a single aluminum block protected with an anodized black finish, to be built locally to save on time and transport costs, to be developed, excuse me, de delivered within a tight time frame to meet the upcoming loan dates, and to be constructed with a very modest budget. So here are the details for our much more modest storage case. The solid aluminum block is milled to provide cavities for a desiccant, an atmospheric pollutant filter, and an atmospheric bellow. An outer support plate is then placed over the cavity. An anodized metal platen to which the document is secured fits in next. And the document does not sit on the metal, it actually sits on a piece of 100% cotton rag board. And finally, the lid which incorporates the UV filter anti-reflective glazing is secured with screws and sealed with a Viton O-ring gasket. And here is a detail of the case construction in the insertion of the Viton O-ring gasket by Eric. Here are the details of the interior fittings. You can see the, the silica gel desiccant at the top of the left image, and it's been conditioned to 40% relative humidity. Activated charcoal is added as a filter to absorb any airborne pollutants. And an air pressure bellow is fabricated from marble seal, which is an aluminized polyethylene and nylon barrier film to regulate small changes in air pressure inside the airtight case. 
the case can provide an anoxic or low oxygen environment in the future if this is deemed necessary to provide further protection for the document by retarding the rate of deterioration. So here is a view of the bottom of the case showing the tubes and valves used to flush out the oxygen and replace it with an inert gas. The document is mounted on the anodized metal platen, which as I mentioned is covered with the rag board, with a specially designed passive system of mylar tabs that are secured with magnets. Inspired by a passive system of document clips developed at NARA, we made custom metal, metal clips to incorporate a mylar sleeve that holds the document with gentle pressure. Therefore, there are no hinges being used on the document. The metal clips are seated into a groove on the verso of the support plate and held in place with countersunk magnets. So here is the proclamation being inserted into the case on the left and the lid being installed on the right. The cost for materials and fabrication of the LAC case is significantly less than the Library of Congress version. This, a storage case was made, for e was made for each copy of the proclamation. And those are Canadian dollars, so when you do the exchange rate, it's a very good deal. Now the display case. This is the second component of the housing system. A Quebec-based company, Zone Display Cases, manufactures high-quality museum cases and was contracted to design and produce the display case to our specifications. The requirements included that it meet all of our security standards, which I cannot give detail of. It must be designed in such a way that it could be easily transported to venues across the country it must be compatible with the preservation and storage case, and it must incorporate measures to control and track cumulative light exposure. It's a simple design, and it accommodates security elements in its base. A button mounted on the front of the case is connected to a timer that can be set to restrict lighting on demand for a set period of time. The display case incorporates several layers of glass, each with a specific purpose. We know already the storage case has a UV filtering anti-glare glass, which is manufactured by OptiView. That's the OptiView. Next, an LED light source embedded in a metal, in a metal frame is installed. Then a security glass that protects, protects the document from any kind of forced entry, otherwise known, I guess, as bulletproof glass. And the top glass protects the other more valuable glass underneath from scratches and can be replaced if necessary. A Veragard smart glass shields the document from vis visible light by electronically Charging its changing its transparency from dark to clear instantly at the push of a button. The smart glass is controlled by a timer that allows the document to be viewed for a predetermined amount of time. A counter tracks the number of times the display button is pushed. A timer inside the case controls the length of time the document is exposed each time the button is activated. And finally, an elapsed time indicator adds up the exposure time, allowing us to monitor total light exposure during an exhibition. The borrowing institution informs LAC of the weekly readings from the counter, and once the agreed to maximum number of light cycles is reached, the document must be removed from display and returned. At this point, the LED lights are set to 50 lux, but are programmable and the timer is currently set to 20 seconds per view. For those of you that are not familiar with smart glass, its ability to control an artifact's light exposure begins with a thin 
light control film that is laminated between glass or plastic substrates. This film contains millions of nanoscale particles. When no electric, electrical voltage is present, the particles randomly orient and block visible light, and thus protecting the artifact. When an electrical voltage is applied, the particles align and allow light to pass through the glazing, which then enables you to see the artifact. This is just a series of um, images showing you the, at the top left, the insertion of the preservation case into the display case. And you see there are heavy duty suction cups being used to do that because of the weight of the case, which is approximately 40 kilograms. Next, the, in, the fiber optic lighting is installed at the top right. Then the Farragard glass, at the bottom left. And finally, after, the, after all of these components are added, the protective glass lid is put on. So now that we have a proper enclosure that answers concerns regarding preservation, access, and security, there's still a separate and equally critical issue that arose from the microfade testing of the signature inks and their vulnerability. We need to think about establishing guidelines or, or standards for permanent inks to be used in signing nationally important documents. So the big question is how to keep inferior ink out of public records and archival collections. When we look into existing standards for inks, we can see a relationship between conservation and security concerns but performance standards are different. The ISO standard is too vague. For archival preservation, we need to specify an acceptable dose of light exposure to just noticeable fade. The British standard is on the right track, but which inks comply to this standard? We must perform our own tests. Eric Hagen at CCI has conducted a literature review and produced a testing framework to conduct light fastness tests on a number of fountain pen inks, ballpoint and roller, pen, roller ball, ball pens. So this test sheet illustrates the fading of dye-based fountain pen samples. Significant noticeable fade occurred just after five megalux hours of exposure. And after 50 megalux hours of exposure, the colors are radically altered. In this trial, we have aged samples of pigmented fountain pens and archival pens. His tests confirmed that products advertised as pigmented inks have light fastness ratings significantly higher than conventional formulations that use synthetic dyes. And you can see there's practically no visual difference when you compare this, the control to the 50 megalux hours of exposure. Product information can be consulted to determine the nature of the colorant and products advertised as pigmented ink are acceptable, such as the trademarked super ink products by Uniball. Short of legislation or internal policies that require the use of a standard ink, which would be difficult to enforce given constantly changing ink formulations and the occasional rule breakers with their favorite pens, the simplest, most immediate approach with broad impact is education. By developing a policy on ink use, we should be able to significantly reduce the risk of inferior ink entering our collections by explaining how to choose quality, light fast, permanent ink, and or providing an approved list. This letter was sent out by the chief librarian and archivist to various federal government agencies. A list of recommended products advertised as pigmented inks included at the end of the letter are included at the end of the letter. Corrections Canada, Stats Canada, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Public Works 
are just a few of the departments that have responded positively. The list is not intended to be exhaustive, and we encourage people to check product information. I should also add that uh, my name and email was included in this letter, and so I did get a number of uh, requests for more information. In the meantime, CCI is gathering more samples to test and hopes to be underway with phase two of this project in the early fall. And in the near future, we intend to share the information on permanent light fast inks on the LAC website and through social media. So, the digital age has given us the tools to increase access to collections via digital platforms, and we have responded with the, the, the increased physical access through partnership opportunities, which has led us to reconsider and formulate more rigorous display parameters. Social media now provides points of access that we never could have foreseen. For example, in this new age, LAC has hired a Wikipedian in residence as part of an LAC pilot project who is dedicated to engaging with the Wikipedia community and with Wikimedia Canada, the nonprofit body that works to increase Canadian content in Wikipedia. Although she has only been with the LAC for a short time, she's already mounted an edit-a-thon at the University of Guelph on Canadian women artists, planned a French language edit-a-thon, identified public domain images at LAC to contribute to Wikimedia Commons, and identified gaps in Wikipedia that can be filled using LAC holdings and metadata. This kind of job didn't exist 10 years ago, and one can only imagine the kinds of jobs that will pop up in the next few years. Institutions have embraced social media, Everyone has a Facebook page, an Instagram account, and is active on Twitter, Flickr, YouTube, and podcasts. As you can see, social media has also, had, also has a growing presence in the communications directorate at LAC. And I believe there are now about 30 employees under that masthead for social media and web publications. Blogs, according to my daughter, are passé. Yet LAC disseminates information on exhibitions and collections materials via its blog. It was an early point of entry into social media used by conservation to showcase interesting treatments and technical information, as in this case, where I was invited to write an entry on an oversized rare movie poster of the first Anne of Green Gables film, produced in 1919. One of our conservators, Elspeth Jordan, has been appointed as a liaison between conservation and the social media committee. And she posts on a very regular basis. And in fact, you're seeing a detail of one of her most recent posts where we got together all of the conservators in Ottawa who had attended the Japanese uh, paper conservation course offered through um, ECROM. And we had a day of exploring Japanese paper and pastes. And here she shows a little snip of, of um, making paste. In general, the thinking is that Facebook and blogs have the most appeal to boomers and people who are interested in genealogy and the archives collection. Twitter skews more towards Generation X and Instagram appeals more to the millennials. Instagram is considered to be the best platform for images and discovery. The picture is more important than the text, and hashtags are a key way to bring people in. The hope is that by showing LAC as an interesting and dynamic place, people will want to learn more about it. And an unexpected bonus is that it's really encouraged are conservators to take more pictures of their working methods and processes. Elspeth coordinates posts from the various labs for use on social media. Each lab makes entries into a social media log to provide consistent content form 
to the social media team. They, in turn, do the translation and scheduling. And as a federal government institution, you may know that all our posts must be in our two official languages, French and English. Occasionally, they'll have questions or want clarification, and they'll reach out to conservators before publication. Conservation gives final approval on all the changes. And they also route any questions posed by the public on the posts back to the conservators for a reply. Each lab approaches the process a little differently. Prints and drawings conservators divide the writing duties up so that each team member comp composes a post every three weeks. The photo lab constantly takes treatment process pictures with a mind to social media. Elspeth then spends an afternoon every few weeks choosing the best images and writing the captions. The other labs work on a more case-by-case -case basis. The more content, and this is important, the more content that is submitted, the more focus on conservation on the account. While it is good for communicating externally with stakeholders, it also informs internal departments about conservation activities. It's not unusual for upper management, especially Monsieur Bertillon, to ask about specific projects that they've seen on social media. So think budget increase. This is a posting on Instagram about the treatment of one of the large prints from the Audubon Birds of America series. These posts are intended to provide glimpses into behind the scenes activities at LAC and conservation and preservation activities are among the most numerous and popular. An initiative undertaken by photo conservator Tassa Pass Tanya Passafume is the production of the first ebook at LAC. Lingua Franca, a common language for conservators of photographic materials, contains bi bilingual definitions of photographic processes, condition issues, treatment objects, preventive care, and technical studies. It also provides commonly used terms, briefly defined and illustrated with photographs, videos, and interactive features, such as links to collection items, podcasts, videos, blogs, and Flickr albums. Conservation professionals, teachers, students, and anyone interested in the field of photography can access it for free on iTunes, and a PDF version is also available. Launched in collaboration with the Atelier de Restauration et de Conservation des Photographies de la Ville de Paris, Lingua Franca contributes to LAC's continued efforts to be at the leading edge of archival and library science and new technologies. This is an example of, of one of those chapters on cleaning with solvents and it provides a link to the Paris website. I also must mention that conservators can use digital platforms for more formal sharing of information. For instance, what if you cannot attend a conference? There are online bloggers at sessions to provide online accounts of lectures and presentations. In the case of the gels in conservation, conference for which registrations rapidly sold out just like a rock concert, you can watch YouTubes of each lecture. Webinars on specific subjects are another vehicle for uniting a conservation audience from literally around the world. This recent example is from AIC's Emerging Conservators Professional Network and the Equity and Inclusion Committee and the subject is gender and leadership in museums today. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. Even if the Mona Lisa is merely a click away on Google, millions still line up to see her at the Louvre, live and in person. 
In a recent video produced for a new album by Beyonce and Jay-Z, the, the, pup the couple posed with numerous iconic pieces at the Louvre. Next time you are in Paris, you can take a 90-minute guided tour of the shoot locations or a self-guided tour highlighting all 17 pieces of art seen in the video. The tours are overwhelmingly popular and sell out on a regular basis. So maybe the next tours will provide a behind the scenes look at the conservation of some of these masterpieces. There is no question that memory institutions have embraced de digital technology. It gives us the means to preserve our documentary heritage and make it accessible. In the face, whoops, in the face of expanded access to our collections and through partnerships and collaborations, conservators will still play a key role in caring for the artifacts, whether preparing them for digitization or for exhibition and display. Our work is more critical than ever as we develop innovative ways not only to safeguard collections for the future, but also to engage audiences to recognize and appreciate our, social, our efforts through social media. And we are certainly learning to harness the digital age to provide platforms for sharing information amongst ourselves on a global level. A few decades ago, I feared that those beautiful, eye-popping, high-resolution, easily accessible images would take the place of the real object. Could this lead to an eventual demise of institutional conservators? After all, digital Im images could be theoretically conserved by photoshopping them to absolute perfection. I'm happy to admit that I was wrong. While technology is a useful ally, nothing can replace the emotion, the visceral response that happens when you come in contact with an original document. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias Ana para esta magnífica presentación y creo que una visión completa de todas las actividades que se están realizando en los archivos y bibliotecas de Ottawa, bueno, en Canadá, uh, creo que una, con lo que han logrado es lo que muchos quisiéramos aquí en muchos lugares obtener. Uh, todavía esperamos, pero la esperanza no era lo último. Y uh, también uh, esta conjunción entre registro, conservación, digitalización, exhibición y una gran organización para que todos estos uh, elementos, todas estas diferentes partes pueden convivir y se pueden realizar y sobre todo tener en mente uh, como los objetivos que es la preservación, la seguridad y el acceso al material y que, y que sí se ve que, que pues, eh, han integrado también las plataformas digitales como un modo del acceso, pero también sin olvidarse toda la parte de preservación y la parte de seguridad del propio documento antes de pasar a la digitalización, los, este, las investigaciones que hacen también para ver qué puede afectar o no el documento, este, en fin, eh, muchas cosas que perdón, pero es como comercial, que hemos puesto en nuestra norma, eh, pensando que, bueno, pues esa es como la manera ideal. Eh, probablemente lo lograremos un día en México, pero, bueno, muchas mentes están en este, enfocando en este canal. Así que, bueno, pues no voy a seguir hablando porque supuestamente, este, pues aquí el público va a intervenir. No sé si hay alguna pregunta, observación este, a esta presentación. Ya se quieren ir a comer, ¿verdad? ¿No? ¿Todo quedó clarísimo?
todos quisiéramos. Yes? Ok. <ríe> um, bueno, pues entonces. Ellos permiten, hola, ¿qué tal? Muchas gracias. ¿Ellos permiten visitas a personas extranjeras o pasantías o estadías? Absolutely. The one, um, the one issue, of course, and it's, I think, a global problem, is that we cannot pay our interns. And so you can apply, and if you come with uh, your own financial resources, that's a good thing. Uh, the interns that we accept usually come from um, recognized conservation programs, but literally from around the world. And we have had some Mexican conservators work with us. Otra pregunta inquietud? No. Do you want to say something? I just wanted to say if there are any other questions, please feel free to approach me during lunch or breaks. Solo una pregunta de la generación de contenidos. Entendí que cada departamento nutre los contenidos y que se se traduce pues a, a los idiomas. Entonces, eh, además, no sería una opción tener un área como completa, más, más completa de difusión, que, que también se dedique a, a dirigirse a esos departamentos y tener un, un, un plan más, pues sí, como más claro de qué es lo que se quiere difundir y no que solo cada departamento como, o como el, sí, que cada departamento decida, sino tener una, una directriz más amplia de, de difusión, si eso existe o, o a lo mejor entendí mal. I just focused on the output from the conservation department, but other areas within the archives are also uh, posting material online. And I I would say that part of the obligation of the social media department is to come up with themes and ideas that drive some of our content. So for example, if there's a, a special exhibition in Ottawa, maybe at the National Gallery, they might ask for content specifically related to that exhibition that could be from digitization, it could be from conservation, it could be from the archivist or the historian. So yes, I, I hope I've answered your question. There is um, definitely a, a thought to make some of those posts um, more collaborative, if you will. Ay. Uh, bueno, pues si ya no hay uh, preguntas, uh, los agradecemos a Anne para su pre por su presentación. Eh, y, ah, ¿hay otra? ¿No? ¿Hay otra pregunta? Ah. Ah. Sí, buenas tardes. Soy Ed Colunga y me gustaría saber si eso que hacen, bueno, es como para este, es la presentación que usted hizo es como para un archivo enorme, que es, una, es un archivo nacional, ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿eso también se puede aplicar o se aplica en Canadá para las bibliotecas estatales o para las bibliotecas un poco más pequeñas? ¿Esos estándares? These standards, these standards you apply in your libraries in Canada, in small libraries? We have um, partnerships, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, part of our um, mandate is to um, provide access and 
um, coordinate smaller institutions to make sure that they have what they need from the federal um, collections. The federal collections being the National Archives and the National Library, which are now Library and Archives Canada. So there are municipal um, partnerships, like the new library going in in Ottawa, which is a, is, is, is a municipal building, which will be um, joining with LAC. And so that way, it's not just a national mandate. It's very much also a provincial and municipal mandate. So I hope this answers your question. Even small libraries have access to some of our programs. And there are committees and, and different activities that include those smaller institutions. Ya, no sé si ya era la última. <risa> okay. uh, bueno, pues entonces, este, nuevamente agradecemos a Anne su presencia. Va a estar con nosotros también para los dos días de curso, jueves y viernes. Y este, les invitamos a mañana, uh, gracias por su presencia el día de hoy, y les invitamos mañana también a partir de las nueve de la mañana. Nueve y media se empieza. Este, entonces, pues que tengan buena tarde. Hasta luego.